Hello, my name is Nick Bright, scholar of East Asian religions. And I'm Proven Paradox, a guy with a lot of questions. And you're listening to Bright on Buddhism, a podcast where we discuss East Asian Buddhism, answering listener-submitted questions from listeners just like you, and introducing concepts of Buddhism that you may or may not be familiar with in a casual, conversational setting. Enjoy. Here, why are people visiting the sites where the Buddha has preached? He's long gone from that place, but they gather as if he's still preaching. If you were to ask them, I bet that they would say that in a way, he is still there. He is still preaching. When we speak of the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, and the Dharma, can we say for sure that the Buddha is not preaching them through us? Alternatively, can we say that we are not repeating his sermons for him, at least in part? If either one is the case, then the Buddha is still preaching, and the first time he did so was in that place, so people go to be closer to the message and closer to the Buddha himself. I suppose such a thing might be possible. It fascinates me because that place was significant for the Brahmins before the Buddha went there. This is part of why he chose to go there. Everyone in the community knows of it. Now I suppose it is significant both to Brahmins and to followers of the Buddha way. Right you are. I imagine it could have even been significant to those who came before the Brahmins as well. Thus, visiting such places as pilgrims must exist in the memory of the community and the families that live here going back a very long time. Indeed. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Bright on Buddhism. This week we will be discussing Buddhist pilgrimage. What is Buddhist pilgrimage? What is the purpose of Buddhist pilgrimage? What are the characteristics of Buddhist pilgrimage stories? We hope you enjoy. Before we get to any of that, though, let's do some background. What is a pilgrimage? So, in order to discuss Buddhist pilgrimage, we will first discuss pilgrimage in general, and then I will tie it back to Buddhism and be more specific with regards to Buddhist pilgrimages that exist. Pilgrimage is the act of leaving your current everyday life to go visit a holy place, be transformed somehow by the journey or the destination or by both, and then return to your daily life an almost entirely new and different person. This transformation is usually regarded to be positive, or else nobody would go on pilgrimages, and it occurs because of the hardships of the journey, the holiness of the destination, or a combination of the two. Pilgrimage is one of the oldest kinds of religious acts in the world. There are textual records of pilgrimages and archaeological records of pilgrims and pilgrimage sites going back as far as 3,000 years ago. Even before the appearance of orthodoxy and ecumenical structure in human religion, there were geographical places that were widely regarded as being somehow holy. This could have been due to being animated or populated with spirits or gods, being the site of some significant myth, legend, or historical moment, or a combination of the two. These places were said to imbue some of their significance, their power, and their holiness onto their visitors. These themes carried over even as religious doctrine, ecumenical structure, and societal influence became more complicated. There are theories that in many places and cultures around the world, religions established these significant places as layers upon layers of overlapping myths, legends, doctrines, and texts developed around them. For example, early Christian churches were often built on sites that were already significant to indigenous pagan traditions, which then themselves became holy sites to Christianity. You may be wondering what makes those particular sites so special to so many different groups of people across time. The simple answer is usually one of three explanations. One, there is some sort of impressive natural formation there, like a mountain, a waterfall, a canyon, or something like that. Two, something legendary happened either in myth history or myth history that keeps people going back to visit that place. Or three, we just simply don't know for sure but we assume that it was either one or two, and either the environment changed significantly or the myths or legends about what happened at that place are lost to time. Note that to ask the question, what makes these sites so special, can open the door to some very pseudoscientific and pseudo-historical nonsense that we don't really deal with on this show. For example, ancient alien theory hawkers with more television shows than sense will proclaim that these sites are significant because aliens visited them and that pilgrimage represented an opportunity in history for humanity to convene with these extraterrestrials. Let me emphasize that this idea, or the idea of a grand lost civilization that predates all of our historical ones, or lost empires that could harvest electricity out of the air, and all sorts of ideas like that, will very deservedly 
get you laughed out of the room in any scholarly or academic circles. What is pilgrimage in a specifically Buddhist context? There has been a lot of scholarly work done on pilgrimage, usually asking the question of what its meaning and significance is in the context of a given religion. It has very specific meanings in religions outside of Buddhism that I can't really speak to since I'm not a specialist in those religions, but in the context of Buddhism, I think it would make sense to talk about Buddhist pilgrimage as being a symbolic death, as being a replication of the life of the Buddha or a bodhisattva, and as being an opportunity to cultivate good merit through proximity to very powerful sites, and also through benevolent acts undertaken along the way. We'll discuss each of these in turn. Pilgrimage as a symbolic death is a theme that reaches beyond just Buddhism. There's been a lot of work done on famous and important Judeo-Christian pilgrimages, such as pilgrimages to Mecca, Jerusalem, El Camino, Canterbury, and so on, which regard the journey as being so transformative that it is symbolically equivalent to death. This leads to major changes, such as a radical perspective shift, new experiences gained, or something significant that is learned. This change is often understood symbolically as a death of the old and a birth of the new. For example, your superficial or instrumental understanding of the divine dies and is replaced with a deeper and more profound understanding based on experience or gnosis, divine knowledge. In more general terms, the person you were before the pilgrimage dies and is replaced with the person you are after the pilgrimage, making the pilgrimage into a landmark for your life. In Buddhist pilgrimage, this symbolic death is very significant, especially in the context that we will be discussing in the following questions. Pilgrimage is an opportunity to leave your delusions, your ignorance, and your unwholesomeness behind, and return purified by the good merit, the wisdom, and the insight gained by your pilgrimage. This merit and insight is gained not only through making offerings at very significant places, but also through interactions with people, and in some versions, even ghosts and spirits that you meet on the road. Next, we can understand Buddhist pilgrimage as the act of replicating the life of a significant figure, such as a Buddha or a Bodhisattva. There are several pilgrimages in Buddhism which exist as waypoints in the lifetime of a particular figure. For example, there are four sites in modern-day India where the historical Buddha Shakyamuni was born, where he reached enlightenment, where he preached the first sermon, and where he died. To make pilgrimage to those four sites in this order is meant to help you realize your own non-duality with the Buddha himself. If you walk in the Buddha's footsteps, then you are replicating his life in your own life. You are symbolically being born, reaching enlightenment, preaching the first sermon, and dying right alongside the Buddha. This replication is not simply like an act of role-playing. Pilgrims are not pretending to be the Buddha and then calling it a day. The significance of replicating the Buddha's life is actually inserting yourself into it and actually participating in it. By walking in his footprints, you are understood not only to be the Buddha himself, but also to know the Buddha, to understand the Buddha, to meet the Buddha, and so on. This leads to a great deal of wisdom, insight, and merit. This is especially significant after Shakyamuni dies in history because of the uncertainty regarding how to reach enlightenment without him. We are not the only ones who are aware that there were many different prescribed practices and concepts that were developed in response to the death of the Buddha with regards to reaching enlightenment. People in the ancient past also knew this, and they also had similar questions that we have now. How do I reach enlightenment in a world without a Buddha to teach me? Some say chanting sutras and following the precepts is our best bet. Another is that the whole world is populated by Buddhas and we just need to realize our own Buddhahood and their Buddhahood as well. Another answer is that we ought to rely on the actions of powerful Buddhas like Amida to save us all. People in the past were aware of these many and varied answers as well as we are, and they were also confused with them at times. As a result, one of the conclusions that many lay people came to was that one should emulate the Buddha's life. If somebody did everything that a Buddha did while he was alive, then how could they not be Buddhas themselves? Thus, pilgrimage to the four sites in India or to other places where famous thinkers and religious figures lived became very popular through much of history. Finally, we should mention pilgrimage as a religious space for merit accrual. Pilgrimage is a unique religious act because its meaning and significance is not limited to the meaning and significance of the holy site itself. It's also deeply connected to what happens to the pilgrim on the road. It has to do with who or what they meet, what miraculous or religiously significant events happen, who they help, and who helps them. The road of any pilgrimage is historically a very dangerous one. In history, there was the danger of disease, bandits, injury, natural disasters, and more. 
Even now, there are many of these same dangers on many of the world's significant pilgrimages. For example, it's likely very risky for Christians, Jewish people, Muslims, and anybody else to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem from abroad due to the escalations of the Israel-Palestine conflict. As another example, it was very dangerous to visit Mecca to complete the Hajj during the COVID-19 pandemic because the large crowds are a recipe for mass infection. Buddhist pilgrimage is just as dangerous. Because of this, there is an unspoken understanding that pilgrims help and support each other on the road. Buddhist pilgrims sometimes wear special clothes to distinguish themselves as pilgrims. This means that other Buddhist pilgrims can identify each other and can be recognized as a pilgrim by the rest of the community. There's an unspoken understanding among pilgrims to support each other on the road as well as the communities they encounter. These communities support the pilgrims however they can because the pilgrims are making a very significant sacrifice and accruing a great deal of merit during the pilgrimage. And the merit isn't just for the pilgrim. Other pilgrims and community members accrue a lot of merit when helping a member of a pilgrimage along the pathway. Additionally, there is great merit in replicating the life of an important figure, as mentioned before. Finally, there are various legends and stories where pilgrims meet the ghost, the spirit, or the manifestation of an important figure while on the road, which is also highly meritorious. What is the purpose of Buddhist pilgrimage? There are many purposes, most of which fall under the category of accrual of good merit or something else like that. In history, Buddhist pilgrimages were often thought to have several types of special salvific power for a number of reasons. For example, one of these types of power was to heal illness. Historically, some people who were very ill would make pilgrimages for the purpose of getting better. Speaking from experience, traveling with a chronic disability or illness is very difficult. And I'm talking about today, when we have airplanes and useful medical science. Massive respect to folks in these circumstances who managed to make that journey. Additionally, some pilgrimages were taken at the end of one's life to attempt to create a karmic or causal connection with the Buddha so that when they pass away, they could be reborn in a pure land or in a heaven. In fact, to die on a pilgrimage is sometimes regarded as extremely meritorious. There are some pilgrimages, particularly in Japanese history, where ritual suicides on pilgrimage routes or sites were very prevalent. For example, there's a site called Kumano in Japan where many monks and pilgrims would commit ritual suicide by going over a waterfall in a boat. It was thought that the waterfall was a route or a portal to the southern Pure Land, or Amida's Pure Land. Usually this sort of act was regarded as bad, but during a pilgrimage, it was understood as a great sacrifice, on par with the sacrifice of one's physical body and one's life. This sort of sacrifice is all very religiously significant in Buddhism. A quick note here, we're going to do an episode on suicide in Buddhism in the future to capture this issue of ritual suicide versus self-immolation versus regular suicide and what the different amounts of good or bad that you accrue are according to the Buddhist texts with those different situations. Another important aspect of merit accrual is to make offerings to the Buddha or to a figure enshrined at the pilgrimage site. These places became pilgrimage sites because of some historical or mythical significance, which affords increased merit accrual as opposed to doing it somewhere else. For example, the four sites in India are closer to the historical life of Shakyamuni, meaning that the merit accrual of making offerings there is far higher than the merit accrued from making an offering at one's own local temple, where Shakyamuni never visited. These sites enshrine the Buddha's remains, and so to visit those sites is far more significant than to visit somewhere else. We've talked about how the remains of the Buddha have come to be regarded as being like the Buddha himself. There are stories of his remains doing magic stuff, like healing the sick, flying around, making gifts appear out of nowhere, and even preaching the Dharma. Thus, to visit these remains places you closer to the merit he created while he was still alive, and the merit that his remains continue to create after his death. This draws on a principle that goes outside of the timeline and the doctrinal purview of just Buddhism. There is this deeply human feeling that if you are physically near to a site where a major historical or religious event occurred, then the power and significance of the event persists long after the event, and that you can experience that power by going to that place. That power stays with you even after you leave the pilgrimage, and it changes your life in a way that no other act really could. Finally, we should mention pilgrimage as an act of sacrifice and benevolence. In religions at large, pilgrimage can be regarded as a sacrifice, and this is part of what makes it so meritorious. This is part of the symbolic death that I mentioned earlier. 
but it's also a sacrifice of time, of the person you were before, of resources and energy needed to undertake a pilgrimage, and so on and so forth. Remember that in Buddhism, such sacrifices are sometimes regarded as being for the benefit of all sentient beings. Because of interdependent origination, all sentient beings share the same nature, and that nature is interpenetration and interdependency. Thus, when one person meditates, chants, makes offerings, or makes a sacrifice, it's positive not just for the participant, but also for beings everywhere. The process of reality around the world is regarded in Buddhism as being nothing more than a complicated relationship of cause and effect that exists between all things. When somebody makes an offering to the Buddha, they are introducing another good cause into the mix, which will create a good effect, which will be another good cause for another good effect, and so on and so forth. Thus, that sacrifice is in the name of all sentient beings everywhere, not just the one individual person. This is also directly observable in the mutual understandings that exist among and between Buddhist pilgrims. The fact that you're expected and understood to support other pilgrims, help whoever you see on the road, and show kindness and compassion to others along the way is sort of a miniaturized reflection of this interpenetration and merit accrual principle. What are the characteristics of Buddhist pilgrimage stories? As we mentioned before, pilgrimages have significance for many traditions, sometimes several at once. A clear example is that Mecca, prior to the 8th century, was a site of polytheistic worship among the tribes of Saudi Arabia. This holds equally true for pilgrimage sites in India, China, and Japan. Many Buddhist holy sites in India were slash are also holy to Hinduism, while Chinese sites are also significant to Taoism or Confucianism and Japanese sites are also holy in the context of Shinto. In the context of other religions, evidence that a given site was slash is holy to a pre-existing religious tradition is usually stamped out. For example, try to find a statue, name, or shrine to one of the pre-Islamic tribal Saudi Arabian gods at Mecca. It's impossible because of the Abrahamic prohibition of worship of false idols. However, in the Buddhist context, there is no such prohibition. So there will be shrines and icons to folk religious gods and spirits at Buddhist sites, and the pilgrim can and should make offerings to all of the enshrined deities at these sites. With regards to stories around pilgrimages, the fact that these sites are so significant to more than one religious tradition leads to overlap in the stories around these sites. For example, one of the most consistent types of pilgrimage story in Japanese Buddhism is one in which the pilgrim will meet the ghosts or spirits of previous pilgrims who have died on the road while they travel. They can show up and help the pilgrim by pointing out the right path, or they can misdirect and trick the pilgrim for their own gain. The latter case is exceedingly rare in the context of pilgrimages, but it's nonetheless possible. When evaluated in a vacuum, Buddhist textual doctrine does not really have these kinds of ghosts or spirits, but as it has encountered and syncretized with indigenous religions as it has traveled across Asia, these sorts of elements have become incorporated into Buddhism's myths, legends, and lore. There's a famous 88 temple pilgrimage in southern Japan, which I plan to take myself next year, called the Shikoku Henro pilgrimage. This route circumnavigates the entire southern island of Shikoku, and along the way you visit 88 temples founded by the founder of Shingon Buddhism, Kukai, during his lifetime. This pilgrimage is the perfect example of the aspects we have been talking about so far. First, it is a pilgrimage that many used to take in history to heal from illness or commit ritual suicide. Second, it is a highly meritorious pilgrimage because you are walking in the footsteps of Kukai. Finally, it is also said that when you walk, Kukai walks with you, and even that you'll meet him on the road. There's this idea called Dogyo Ninin, which translates to same path, two people. This idea is reflective of a symbolic and metaphorical idea that his teachings follow you and support you throughout your life, even though he's not physically there with you. But it can also be taken literally. On the pilgrimage route, you are said to meet Kukai himself. If you do the entire pilgrimage, which is around 750 miles or 1200 kilometers in total, you are said to meet him on the road as an unnamed pilgrim who helps and supports you along the path. In addition to him, you may meet pilgrims who appear to be alive and walking with you, but who are actually ghosts of pilgrims who have died on the road a long time ago. This is a source of anxiety, of course, but also a source of wonder, because in the vast majority of cases, the ghosts are harmless and or helpful, or they ask for the pilgrim's help in some unthreatening way. One opportunity for merit accrual during a pilgrimage is to be visited by a spirit in need and help them somehow. For example, 
It is a common legend that a pilgrim will meet a spirit or ghost in the form of some other unnamed pilgrim, and the spirit or the ghost will ask for directions to the next stop on the path. The pilgrim gives those directions, but then never sees this ghost again, and there are no witnesses to confirm that the interaction ever took place, or that the ghost who was appearing as a pilgrim ever made it to the next stop. The idea in that legend is that the pilgrim helped that spirit move on to their next rebirth, or they showed them to the pure land with that single act of compassion. Of course, it is possible to interpret this type of legend as a case where somebody met someone else on the road, and because the interaction only happened one time and there were no witnesses to it, they interpreted it as being a meeting with a spirit. But the legend nonetheless plays a role in the lore of the pilgrimage itself. The pilgrimage is said to create a different relationship between the pilgrim and the divine. Before they may have had a cursory or superficial understanding of the world, but after taking the pilgrimage, they come back with a deep experiential and spiritual understanding that only can be gained through taking the journey. This concludes our discussion of Buddhist pilgrimage. We hope you enjoyed. Join us next week where we will be discussing suchness. What is suchness? How ought we understand it? How have understandings of suchness changed over time? We hope to see you there. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Many thanks to our patron, Tanner. If you would like to join him, please take a look at patreon.com slash brightonbuddhism. We thank you for your support. My name is Nick Bright, scholar of East Asian religions and the voice of hearer. And I'm Docs, editor, question asker, producer, and voice of hermit. And this has been Bright on Buddhism. Thank you for listening. If you like our podcast, or if you have a question you'd like for us to discuss, we'd love to hear from you. Please consider leaving a comment, a review, or subscribing, or joining us on social media. Email us at bright.on.buddhism at gmail.com, or find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash brightonbuddhism. As always, citations and resources for this episode can be found in the show notes. Thank you.